So I'd like to invite you all, at least in your minds, to come with me to Panama, which is where I live. And it sounds pretty good right now because it's hot and humid there and warm. Uh, in Panama, we have, uh, we have a dry season and a wet season. Central Panama, the dry season or the wet season lasts about, about eight months. And we're at the end of the, end of the wet season right now. And so the skies are typically bright and sunny and the afternoons are punctuated with thunderstorms. But I'd like you to imagine that instead of the skies being bright and sunny, that it turns black and it starts raining buckets and buckets and buckets of rain. It is the end of the wet season and the storm goes on for a week. Picture the, the rivers swollen with water and the city streets overflowing. Well, that very thing happened in December of 2010, at the end of what was already on track to be one of the wettest years on record in the Panama Canal watershed. Uh, the, the Panama Canal watershed experienced the flood of record. There was so much rain that uh, the Panama Canal Authority had to close the canal for transit and had to open for 17 hours and had to open up all of the locks and all the floodgates and evacuate as much water as fast, as safely, and efficiently as possible. Now, Madden Dam is a dam above on the Chagres River, and it forms a reservoir that stores water for the dry season. And above that is a 100,000 hectare forested national park. Well, Madden Dam was at the specifications of what it was built to withstand. So uh, uh, um, we have a research project in the Panama Canal watershed where we measure stream flow and we measure stream flow under different land uses. We have forests and we have deforested landscapes and we have pastures, a very deforested landscape. And we have the same soils and geology as the whole uh, upper Chagres watershed, that 100,000 hectare forested national park. So if we do a thought experiment and we deforest that national park. So, one, two, three, four. That we had in our pasture to that area we estimate that we would have had 100 million additional cubic meters of water that would have hit that dam right when it was at risk of breaching. Now, if you don't know what a cubic meter is, 100 million of anything is a lot, right? Well, a cubic meter weighs a metric ton. And to put that into perspective, an elephant weighs a metric ton. So imagine 100 million elephants worth of water hitting that dam right when it was most vulnerable. So we believe that the forest saved the dam in fact, uh, the forest uh, helped save the economy of Panama. We're told that uh, when, if, the canal, if the canal infrastructure would have been breached, that it would take four years still to fill the canal with water. So if it had not been for the forest, we believe that we would not have celebrated the expansion of the canal in 2016 with the opening of the new set of locks, but we'd still be rebuilding, uh, the forest, we'd be rebuilding the dam and the infrastructure and the, really the economy of Panama. So La Purissima, La Purissima was the name of our storm, and it was our superstorm. And we know that uh, one of the predictions that climate scientists have great confidence in is that we'll have more frequent severe weather events in the future, right? And the past is not a good prediction of the future. Well, La Purissima was estimated to be anywhere between a 100 and a 300 year return storm. So we all know that that does not mean that we're good for another 200 years, right? But it does mean that it's rare. It's very rare, or at least it should be. On November 24th, 2012, less than two years after La Purissima, we had another major storm. We had flooding and we had loss of life in the Panama Canal watershed. In 2016, Panama missed, just missed getting its first ever hurricane, Otto. We didn't get the hurricane force winds, but we did get the rainfall. And in both of these extreme events, we had significantly more water in our deforested area than we had in our forested area. So when we set out to try to understand the role that forests play in regulating water, we didn't know that we capture the three largest storms in the last 50 years, but we did. What we were really trying to understand is whether in a seasonal climate, a tropical forest can absorb water during the wet season and slowly release it during the dry season. If in this climate, we would have in the dry season more water in our forested watershed than we would on our deforested landscape. And that's, that's known as the, uh, the sponge effect. And so we have consistently recorded the forest sponge at our, at our research site. Uh, and over 10 years of research, anyway, over 10 years of research, we've consistently uh, measured this. And so if we think of that 100,000 hectares of forested landscape of Chagres National Park above, above the dam, if we apply the excess water that we had in our forest during the dry season there, that would equal 20% of all of the water that the 2 million plus people who get their water out of the entire Panama Canal watershed need during the dry season. So, um, lost my train of thought, that they need during the dry season. Uh, we're, not just, we're not just measuring stream flow in what we do though. 
Uh, what we're doing is we're also trying to understand and study how to restore the, the, how, the forest's ability to capture water. And that's, that's the key mechanism in the forest sponge and providing dry season water. So let's, uh, let's talk about a forest and let's talk about trees. In 2008, colleagues published a paper documenting the forest transition in Panama. And so researchers believe that once a country has a certain socioeconomic status, that people will abandon the land, if you will, and they'll move to the city for better economic opportunity. And that um, once on this abandoned land, seeds will arrive and they'll germinate and a young, vibrant secondary forest will grow. And that we call that process secondary succession. And articles that were published suggesting that the secondary forest would pick up the slack for the loss of biodiversity in mature tropical forests that caused quite a bit of controversy, and some of you may actually remember that. Well, the bad news for those of us who care about forest and climate change is that the forest transition has been reversed in Panama, as it has been in many Central and South American countries where it's been documented. But there is good news, and the good news is that we've recently con conducted analysis of, of deforestation in Central Panama, and what we found is that uh, in the Panama Canal watershed, over the first 10 years of the millennium, that the deforestation rate was, was decreased by some 80%. And that's on the order of the best news that comes out of the Brazilian Amazon that's consistent with the uh, creation of the Amazon Fund, right? Unfortunately, just outside the Panama Canal watershed, the deforestation rate is uh, two to four times higher than it is in the watershed. So we wanted to get further into this and try to understand what does this mean for the future? And so we leveraged several data sets that we have in studies in Panama. And the first is in 2012, Greg Osner of the Carnegie Airborne Observatory led a publication on the first ever map of a country, Panama, uh, of its forest carbon using the LIDAR technology. And this is a technology of extraordinary accuracy and precision. And then we have our own study of secondary forest growth across the landscape. And we have 108 plots where we're measuring secondary forests and we're documenting the growth every year. There's 100,000 trees that are measured every year. And so we came up with a new growth model. And then we used that deforestation rate. We made a landscape change model. And we projected these recent trends out into the future over the next five or six decades. And what we found was that we're going to lose a lot of forest. We'll lose 140,000 hectares of forest. But at the same time, we're going to gain a lot of carbon, and that carbon is a result of growth of that young secondary forest that remained from the forest transition. So whereas we'll lose 4.5 million tons of carbon in this area, an area about 20% of Panama, we're still going to gain over three times that amount. So the protection that forests afford from floods, the provision of dry season water, the capture of atmospheric carbon, these are all ecosystem services, and we've just been hearing about those. And I'm sure that many of you recognize a whole host of goods and services that humanity gets from, from natural ecosystems, and these are generally taken for granted from the general public. Well, in an era of, of fake news, of alternative realities, and systematic attacks on science, I'm here to tell you that were it not for science, we never would have understood and appreciated the ecosystem services afforded by forests in central Panama and the Panama Canal watershed. Fortunately, there are researchers all over the world who are studying ecosystem services and how to restore them. So we're entering the Christmas season and the holidays, the end of the year, and it's a time for many of us that we reflect. And I know that I have a lot to be thankful for, as I'm sure that you are, too, you do too. But one of the th things that I'm thankful for is for, for all of you and the people like you who are out there fighting the fight to make sure that we have a future that includes forests, wilderness, and one where we can confront the obstacles in front of us in combating climate change. Our own research and the research of others like us, it helps inform these great initiatives and show the importance of science in that. Working together, I'm sure that we can all build that sustainable future that we all want and that we all need. Thank you.